Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger. But you knew that, hey, it's a great day to be alive. Really? I mean, what? yes, I mean that. Of course I mean it. Why are you looking at me like that? I don't, come on. I'm being 100% honest right now. Put a pin in that. I want to come back to it because I want to tell you that I've got a great interview for you today. His name, the interviewee that is, is Michael Arsenault, and he's the New York Times bestselling author And he's got a new book out called I Don't Want to Die Poor, in which he chronicles the debilitating nature of his student loans that he's been carrying since he graduated from Howard University a few years ago. Anyway, he's a very funny, very insightful writer, and I look forward to sharing our conversation with you in just a few minutes. Let's go back to that. It's a great day. Is it a great day? I mean, yeah, it's a great day, but is it like the greatest of great days? I don't know. I don't know. I feel like I just want to be honest, you know, like, because I find myself mustering up perhaps a tad more enthusiasm than is merited for the purported benefit of my children. I'll be making them breakfast in the morning because that's when you eat breakfast. And I'll be like, hey, we're going to have a great day of homeschooling. And, you know, we'll take a walk later or we'll play basketball or, you know, whatever. And I can just see them going, uh, hey, dad, we know you. Okay. Like we get that you're trying to be optimistic, but we know you're a bit of a curmudgeon. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm really this enthusiastic about this day. I am. I've got the joy, joy, joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. That's where. That was a song we used to sing at vacation Bible school because my parents couldn't afford real camp. Well, that was part of it. It's a long story. But anyway, Vacation Bible School is this week or two week period where you go back to your Catholic school during the summer wearing shorts, and it's supposed to be better because you play more kickball on a percentage basis during the day than you do during the regular school year. Anyway, I went a lot. Forget about theology or whatever, but here's what I hated about Vacation Bible School were those moronic songs. They'd have these cultish refrains like the joy, joy, joy down in my heart. Not only was it like, water torture with that repetition. The music was terrible and I didn't believe any of it, right? It was like, I've got the joy, joy, joy down in my heart as if repeating it over and over would actually create joy in my heart. When in fact I was sitting there thinking, I think my heart is full of realism. I think I've got that realism, realism, realism down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. That's where. Anyway, perhaps I'm a little cynical, but I have been doing my best. I have been doing my best during the quarantine. I bet you have been too, to try to just have a good attitude, to choose to be happy during this time, to choose to be as productive as you can be, all the while being as kind to yourself as you can. Hope you're doing well. We're doing okay over here. And let me tell you a little bit more about Michael Arsenault. Michael Arsenault is the New York Times bestselling author of his first book, I Can't Date Jesus. And he's got a new collection of essays out called I Don't Want to Die Poor, in which he shares the pain that he has experienced in his life, struggling under the weight of these oppressive student loans. Yes, he knew what he was doing when he signed those papers, but in retrospect, He's got a lot of thoughts on the effect this debt has had on his life and is having on an entire generation of students right now. Michael is a graduate of Howard University. He's known for his biting wit and cultural insights. His writing appears regularly in top publications, including the New York Times, Washington Post, Esquire, Rolling Stone, Wired, The Atlantic, and many more. We spoke over Zoom from his apartment in Harlem, where he is sheltering in place. One caveat, folks, I'm trying to make this show as apolitical as possible, not because I don't have deep and well-formed opinions about the political powers that be in the world, but because this show is about money and that affects all of us and that I want everyone who wants to do money better to want to listen to this show. And I don't want to turn them off by constantly pounding on one side of the aisle or the other. And I mention all this just to say that at the same time, I want my guests to be able to come on and share freely on how they see the world. And in this case, Michael has some definite opinions about President Trump, which he expresses quite clearly 
in this interview. So if that kind of thing might upset you, I invite you to listen to another episode of Crazy Money. Last week's episode with Lori Gottlieb was fantastic. Some of my favorites are those with Ryan Holiday from last year, with uh, Sir Angus Deaton from last year, with my wife Stacy from last year. So if you're looking for a good conversation, but you're not down for the political stuff today, check something else out. For the rest of you, I strongly encourage you not only to listen to this interview with Michael, but to check out his writing. Again, his new book is called I Don't Want to Die Poor. This is my conversation with Michael Arsenault. Just because you found a way to like make cat food seem edible or like you could live off of like wild caught Trader Joe's canned tuna for like seven years to pay off your $666,000 in debt. That's not an inspirational story. None of us should have to be doing anything like that to pay off debt. My name is Paul Ollinger. I'm a stand-up comedian with a background in the corporate world. I hit the lottery when I worked at a small company called Facebook. I'm fascinated with money, why we're so obsessed with it, and how it makes us happy or not. Welcome to Crazy Money. Michael Arsenault, welcome to Crazy Money. Thank you so much for having me, especially during a pandemic of all. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we were supposed to do this interview live in person when you were coming to Atlanta for your book tour, but now we're doing it remotely during week five of quarantine. Where are you today and how are you doing? I'm actually really sorry we didn't get to do it in person because those are usually better. And also, I really, really, really wanted biscuits. Um, and I miss <laughs> it so much. And I guess because everyone has like a new kink where they want to try to pretend they can bake. There's no flour, so I can't even order the biscuits that a place in Harlem has. Right. Uh, the Boulevard Bistro. I'm in Harlem. It's interesting. I was in uh, New York, New Orleans, and L.A. within the two weeks right before everything shut down everywhere. Oh, man. So that was mildly terrifying. I would rather be in Houston, but I'm in Harlem. New York, you know, it's a great city, but it's kind of a scary time. All you really hear are like birds and sirens. I'm keeping Coop in the small apartment that I thought I would be moving out of um, (laughs) around this time. But, you know, I'm grateful to have a place to stay. So it's fine until this is over, whenever that is. Yeah. Now, your first book, I Can't Date Jesus, was a New York Times bestseller. So I'm sure you had very high expectations or high hopes for this one. How does it feel to release it amidst a pandemic? Um, it's a nightmare. Uh, I'm actually, I guess maybe sometime really soon, next few days, I'll find if I you know, made the list again, at least the first week out. It's a nightmare. On one end, you're really grateful to even be in the position to talk about such things. But at the same time, you know, it's already challenging to try to sell books in this market. It's even worse when it's a pandemic. And not only is it a pandemic, it's at a time where, frankly, a lot of people are suffering basically in another depression, one that could potentially be even worse than that of which we didn't even, you know, were allowed to experience. So it's it's a weird time because I'm asking people to buy the book, but the book is also about financial hardship. It's a little bit of a mind fuck, but at the same time, you know, it's my livelihood as I've been trying to say on Instagram when I'm like begging people to please buy the book. (laughs) (laughs) Right, Right. I wonder if people are reading more now that a lot of people are stuck at home. I think so. But, you know, there's some people right now who really just cannot function. And, you know, even me working from home, us working from home, it's both a luxury and sometimes a nightmare <laughs> in of itself. Because, you know, working from home, home could quickly become work and you become a dungeon. Yeah. But I think people have a lot of time. But the people who want to read, I will say those who have already picked up the book, they appreciate the fact that You know, it's interesting. Some people say your book is so timely now. The book was timely before this. In fact, much of what I write about in the book, which is largely kind of still about inequality Mm -hmm. and the difficulties of maintaining real social mobility in this country, or at least achieving, it was already timely, which is why so much of this is worse than it needs to be. But I do take comfort in the fact that people who have been reading it find the book comforting because I'm really honest about, frankly, what it's like to struggle with money, which is something a lot of people this year or now are already kind of facing because most people are kind of two checks away from financial hardship, no matter how much you're making. And this is a wake up call right now. I'll quit now. (laughs) Well, no, I think it's important because, you know, you went to college with dreams of social mobility. You wanted to take yourself to a new level and you probably didn't think about it or you write about how you didn't think about how you were going to encumber yourself with these financial debts. And so it's interesting that your ambition was to be a part of a society that you didn't grow up in. And yet your efforts to get there kind of have delayed your ability to arrive. It's pretty much the story of a lot of people. I think, you know, in, in my context, this is that coming like black working class, being gay, 
I know that the marketing copy of the book, and that's not a jab, I, I, I get the, the purpose, but it, you know, it's sold as like, you know, me trying to pursue my dream. And sure, yeah, I was trying to pursue my dream, but if you read the book, like it's very much a, I took a risk, but it was very much a calculated risk. And I knew that the loans would be expensive. I knew it was going to be a lot of debt. I guess what I didn't anticipate was that the industry that I was entering media, which I knew, you know, don't start off paying a lot of money. They make you do a lot of basically indentured servitude, but they give you a cute little title as intern and you're doing real work without being paid. You have to be able to avoid the sacrifices to even be in that position. Like I was, I didn't know everything at 17, but I knew a little bit about that because I did my research. I guess I didn't realize media as I knew it would implode and that, you know, as far as the internet goes, we've been giving away material. Well, I haven't, but at least 25 years for free. And now we're only now realizing like, hey, we should have a subscription model. So they don't have like make advertising money, which is now controlled by like Google and Facebook. So a lot of these outlets don't know how to make money. There was nothing I could have done, you know, when digital imploded and traditional media didn't prepare for it. That was beyond my control. And so was the, you know, George W. Bush. You know, I'm not on the Supreme Court. I didn't vote for him for president. When he imploded the economy, I graduated around the same time. Like some of these things are like just beyond my control. And really kind of accepting that allowed me to forgive myself for the mistakes I made with the best interests. I did the best I could with the information that I had. Right. And I didn't have much, but it was with the best intentions. But even now, for the first time in a lot of people's lives, particularly millennials, I just turned 36 on Easter. This is the first time in my lives we have any semblance of actual security. And mind you, that, don't even, that doesn't necessarily include a house <laughs> or like other stuff, but it's just literally like, I feel like in my bank account, if I open my checking uh, app, it doesn't frighten me to death. <laughs> and that I might actually be able to pay off some shit by the end of the year and be better. And now that might not even be true because of not only a pandemic, but the fact that a racist game show host is at the helm of tackling the pandemic and is dead set on turning America into like the Taj Mahal in the 90s when it was like a rundown thing. So like now people are like, what the fuck am I going to do? I'm doing that right now. I'm like, oh, shit, I went through the struggle. I very much humble myself. I still humble myself even now. I finally get around the corner and look what happened. And there are still people who want to email me because they've already started. Like, it's your fault. Right. Is it? (laughs) Well, I think we all, you know, come out of college with sort of like, I'm going to go set the world on fire. My life, my career is going to be one straight shot up and to the right. I'm going to set the world on fire, you know, but it's not like that. I didn't even think that because I'm black. I mean, it's like this. I think once I've been doing some of the interviews and then like, you know, the anxieties of certain stuff, I'm like, well, I mean, I don't mean this is a TV a dick. I'm like, well, did you read the book? I'm like, I'm black. Like, I'm just kind of, I mean, that's not all black people's story, but I'm very clear, like, you know, <laughs> Southern to Houston, I'm telling you what the economic makeup is. Like, you get it or you should. I had, I guess one thing I will say, my sister says, like, I'm sorry you didn't grow up with a rich white family. <laughs> yeah. A lot of this debt that I took on and a lot of, I wanted to go to NYU, as I mentioned in the book, I couldn't afford NYU. I couldn't afford Howard, but Howard was the one place I saw with so many black people of all stripes that I knew went to like Debbie Allen, Felicia Shaw, people I could black people I could identify who were literally in every trace of my life, be it medicine, arts, whatever. They went to that school. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna take this risk, I'm gonna take this risk because they actually can give me access to media with their school of communications. I did not kid myself about these internships, I didn't kid myself about the market. I knew exactly how hard it was gonna be. My thought was if I just grit my teeth and go through with it, and ultimately they'll get there. I guess maybe my only naive part was that I really just assumed if I kept going and kept pushing and kept proving myself, that eventually I would get treated, to be blunt, like most of the white boys who get it by virtue of just showing up. Um, that was maybe my mistake, but I didn't enter any of this with blinders. I guess I just didn't realize just how difficult it is to overcome things that I just, again, can't control like other people's perceptions about me. Let's go back to the day you graduated from college. How did you feel about your Mm -hmm. future on that day? Well, I graduated a year late because I had some health things and literally my body was crashing. I had like, I was on the staff of the paper, which was a job. I had another uh, like uh, organization I was running. I had 21 credits. I was doing some other kind of work, you know, to float. Literally started passing out, failed a class. And I was a really, you know, good student and just crashed and burned. And I felt relieved, not so much about the added debt, but because the year before, with all due respect to Smokey Robinson legend, Oprah Winfrey turned out to be the graduation <laughs> speaker, commencement speaker at Vermont. So it's like, if I got to do this shit late, at least Oprah's there. Oprah beats So the Smokey. day of, I felt, Oprah, yeah, Oprah beats Smokey. I respect Smokey, hits on hits, original Neo, he could never. Neo wishes, I get it, but it was different because Oprah was there. So it was a lot of a joy 
But I think, you know, as I mentioned in the book, that feeling kind of went away quickly because Oprah told me not to worry and you should listen to Oprah. But it's hard not to be afraid when you get a letter and it's just like, okay, so this is how much you owe and you're only going to get two six month increments to defer forbearance. And then you're going to have to pay us this for the remainder of 12 years. Absent literally nothing outside of maybe a hurricane. My audience, I know some of them probably have student loans. Some of them paid off student loans. I had $100,000 worth of student loans at one point. But explain that again, how that works. So for the life of the loan, you only get two deferments. Is that right? Well, yeah. Okay. So I understand that most people have their debt in terms of federal. I mean, for a lot of students, but particularly Black college students and Black college students at HBCUs, because even though Howard is a rubber guard institution, does get some federal charge like money at the time, like that school still needs resources like everyone else and doesn't get as much resources as a Harvard or even certain like state schools and sure. certain places for right. whatever reason. And for plenty of black schools, which means they can't provide as much financial aid. Mm-hmm. So I mentioned in the book, like there was a very attractive college recruiter back when I was still in about my sexuality that I looked into <laughs> his face and those beautiful eyes. He looked like an <laughs> R&B singer. Um, yeah. And he convinced me that I could really still have my big ambitions outside of the state of Texas. And I won 17 scholarships in like a semester. So it's not as if I didn't try it's just that there was no one at the school before that. And not that they weren't encouraging me, but they didn't encourage me to dream that big. Right. And that's a testament to how they speak to folks, particularly where I grow up. And so I had to turn to private loans. And I had to, but that, again, little information, don't know as much. And people, frankly, take advantage of folks like us and me. Sure. You go through private loans. Think about private loans that you're no longer in control with the federal government. You're going to the private sector. Mm -hmm. And we all know how generous and kind the private sector can be to people. So instead of some people, they get 20, 25, 30 years. Now, granted, with federal loans, you don't want to keep delaying paying all that interest because you end up paying sometimes maybe three, four times more than the debt. However, the trade-off is maybe they don't control so much of your life. In my case, it's a 12-year plan with very little options. Only now, literally within the last six months, they allowed me this thing where they would give me six months to only make um, interest-only payments. But that would mean still my payments would balloon even more. So I would still have to finish off the terms of that 12 year thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, yep. after literally more than a decade and no type of reprieve outside of natural disasters, and that's only twice, actually once, now all of a sudden they will let me pay off the interest. But that's actually given me some space. And I've thankfully paid off some of the principal. I've been in the position where I use some of my book advance, some of the royalties I got from my first book, because most authors don't, you know, get royalty checks, but when you get paid like $3 for the first book, <laughs> royalties. Um, so their low expectations like help me trying to pay this off. But yeah, that's just been my life. It's, and it's controlled every facet of my life, as I kind of mentioned in the book. Because the government loans I've been able to put, you know, in forbearance when I can and pay what I can. When, but those private loans, you know, it's over a $1,000 a month. Hey, everybody, it's Paul. Yeah, I was just talking to Michael, but now I want to talk to you for just a second. Hey, if you're new to Crazy Money, and I know many of you are because I see the numbers, or if you just haven't gone back and listened to all the back episodes, I want to encourage you to check out the catalog. We've been doing this for about a year, and I've talked to some very interesting people. If you like today's episode, another one you might like is my conversation with a guy named Mike Viking, who's the CEO of the Happiness Institute in Copenhagen, Denmark. Yes, Denmark. He also wrote a book called The Little Book of Hygge, which is a Danish word that I'm butchering, I'm sure, but it's all about some of the secrets to happiness that Danes put in practice regularly. It's not overcomplicated, it's quite simple, and most of them are quite cheap. Anyway, that episode came out on November 5th, 2019, and it's Mike Viking, M-E-I-K-W-I-K-I-N-G. It would be the US equivalent of like Roy Cowboy or something. I don't know. Anyway, Mike Viking, November 5th, after and only after you've listened to this entire Michael Arsenault interview, go check out my conversation from last year with Mike Viking. All right, back to Michael. How much debt did you have when you walked and how much debt do you have left now? I think it was around 100,000. It was a little over 100,000. It was in the low 100,000s because of that extra year on top of some of that, I realized that government stuff. Now, the private loan that I write about that's been so obnoxiously <laughs> decimated my life, at least I feel like, um, not fully like good. That's about 18000 left, maybe nineteen. The terms will require me to pay that all off by the end of next year. I'm actively working to pay off as much of that as possible this year. But, you know, I have to also be mindful of the fact that 
I don't know what's happening with the economy. (laughs) So, but I'm really just trying to pay off as much debt as possible actually because of the economy. And then there are the government loans, which have been in forbearance and have like ballooned because of the debt. But I actually worry less about that because that's more like, I don't know, 40, 50 left, Mm -hmm. but I can deal with that later because at least it's manageable. It's just the private loans were not manageable. They just never been amenable. It's never been no, oh, let's make it 15 years instead of 12 years. So Mm. we'll lower the payments at least by $200. It's nothing. It's just literally like you owe us pay or you'll default. (laughs) Right. You write that, quote, there has not been a day in my life that I've not thought about my overwhelming debt. Let me ask you, how long after you wake up do you start thinking about your bills? Depends on if someone hits me in the morning. Um, <laughs> well, I'll be honest, this morning I woke up thinking about, damn, if I were, you know, if they weren't so racist, xenophobic, transphobic, sexist, and awful, I might entertain Republicanism as progressive as I'd like to be. These taxes hurt. Um, no, I think I will say I worry less as it relates to just, you know, not being able to literally wake up without agony. I'm not in that place anymore. Mm. However, I'm very cognizant of the fact that, you know, again, because it, it, it's literally, this is my, this is the second great teenager generation financial disaster of my adulthood. I just turned 36. Mm-hmm. This is my second in like 12, 13 years. So if it's anything I've learned, it's like, no matter how much, you know, how hard you work, no matter how much you save up, no matter what you do, in some cases, you are just not in control of your fate. And it is scary to say this out loud, but as encouraged as I am about, my next steps, a lot of that is contingent on the fact that a racist game show host is in control of my fate and our fates. His handling of the pandemic has impacted me on in terms of not being able to have a tour and you actually really do the work to get a lot of the sales, which is why I'm grateful to even have space here. It's also, you know, a lot of people don't have jobs and they don't have, they weren't given money, you know, so they can't really buy the book, even though I'm trade paperback and, you know, I tell people I'm more affordable. The fact is, it's harder for people to get books. Like, I've tried to buy books for people, you know, help little ways that I can, because I'm not rich, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you make 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 120, you could make that type of money and still be broke. It's just, you earn more, but again, like, if you're two checks away from stuff, you know, you're going to be just as fucked as anybody else. You actually, the fall will actually be harder. So knowing that, I'm like, take it day by day. I'm not worried today. I'm not waking up trembling. You know, again, I I do want to, there's some bills that I'm still like, but I also try not to let any of that contain me the way it did throughout the book. Cause it's just kind of like, you do the best that you can and that's all you really can do. As I was reading your book, I come from slightly better financial circumstances, but found myself in my early adulthood, you know, a hundred grand in debt with $9,000 of the credit card bills, making $26,000 a year. Right. I remember waking up and being like, maybe I'd make it 15 minutes without thinking about how screwed I was financially. And it occurred to me, you know, I'm, as my financial life has improved greatly, you know, it, it reminded me just how it affected me on an, almost on an organic level, how like I felt, I didn't feel fully, I was human, but I wasn't an autonomous adult. And I know exactly that. Yes, I know. I know what you mean. So how how did it hold you back from being a full person? You know, I think in, our, in my first book, I Can Date Jesus, I write about how basically people's projections, the faith I was indoctrinated, Catholicism and my own early exposure to AIDS, that impacted my lack of intimacy, my, mm-hmm. my issues with intimacy, mm-hmm. why I didn't feel like I was fully enjoying pleasure. And that was stripping me of an adulthood. I think in I Can Day Jesus, I write about the beauty of figuring out who you are under your terms. And there's a beauty in that. Mm -hmm. At the same time, true freedom comes with a cost. Choice is expensive. Happiness can be expensive. Money doesn't cure all problems. But when people talk about that, I'm like, well, being rich allows you the means to get to happiness or at least some sense of if you feel safe, you can deal with a lot mm. better than you can if you don't. And that's what I need like more people to understand. So I talk about how it's impacted my body, uh, how it, like me not wanting to date, me feeling less than. It was It's another step of me depriving myself, partially because I just didn't have the means. But also I let the fact that, you know, this struggle, I allowed it to just make me feel so low about myself. As, because in this country, like we have such a contempt for poor people. Mm-hmm. And even you, like, even if you came for better means, maybe you could have, if worse came to worse, 
go like to your folks. But Absolute, maybe you absolutely. Have, but you could have. Yes. But I'm just saying like you, you might have been able to, but then maybe not because depending on what happened at any given moment, particularly again, the way our society is just kind of structured, that could have been pulled from under you too. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like other things might have allowed you like, you know, you're white, you, that might have helped. But still, you shouldn't be in that position either. And I shouldn't be in that position. I can also think of a black woman in a worse position. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's very frustrating to always think about it, but I do think it's important, you know, when people read it, they're going to have some of these same feelings. They, they won't, you know, feel like they, they have conquered them in, in the way that I write about them. Yeah. But I do, you know, hope people take away from the fact that you like, you know, when you do the best that you can, a lot, again, a lot of this is just so much not our fault. I know that I just keep going back to that, but it's just something that simple, but that really does need to be more of a message. It's not our fault. In a lot of ways, this is all designed for you to fail unless you're already kind of rich and structured in the way most people really benefit from how society works. It's going to be harder for you and it's easier for you now more than ever, particularly in my generation to fall through the cracks. Well, on the one hand, I think for me, you're absolutely right. I could always go back to my parents' house and I'm sure I, I have received privileges by being white. I mean, I've moved back home twice, but that's just what I'm saying. You know, right. like, even that is like a benefit to me. Yeah. Like, I can do that. But I think some of this is sort of like a part of it is a coming of age of like, you realize how just getting by is a pretty good thing. Like if you're an yes. adult that you have enough money to pay your bills and pay your rent and not have these existential crises every month about like, how the hell am I going to pay these bills? That's kind of succeeding, you know? And I just remember being like, I want to date, but I can't afford to take a girl to brunch. I can't spend 14. Yeah. I don't have $14 to spend getting to know somebody. So I was really inhibited. Has, has being broke kept you from committing to relationships you otherwise would have pursued? Yeah, actually, there's a, um, a chapter where I write about somebody that I met that I essentially felt he came across as like the kind of person I think everyone wished I had become. Not that they aren't <laughs> proud of me, but what do you mean? He, like he is a natural writer, but he's a practicing lawyer. Mm-hmm. You know, like he didn't mm-hmm. write for a living. Yeah, he went to expensive schools and has a lot of debt too, but he went on to be like a corporate lawyer. And then I've met people who worked in like finance. But the guy that I write about in particular, actually, um, I found him really, really amazing. And I think at maybe some point he might have actually felt the same way, but I kind of screwed it up by frankly just not being confident enough because I was broke. So I've been on dates where I'm like, I make sure I, you know, I didn't have the money so I couldn't do it. Or I felt like I couldn't really commit to somebody because of it. And actually, Mm -hmm. um, I have been really embarrassed about the state of my apartment. I've changed some things since then. And thank God I did since I'm stuck in this place for the foreseeable future. But I was really embarrassed about how my place looked. And I woke up one day. Now, I hadn't always been, but when things got really hard, I just woke up one morning and looked around and was like, this is a depressed person. Mm. A depressed person lives here. Right. I can never bring somebody here. And I didn't bring someone else here. I was blocking my own blessing in that from in multiple ways, but I messed up a connection more than once based on my feelings of inadequacy. Because also we're both, we're different in our sexualities, but we're both men and a lot of masculinity, the identity and your framework is tied to your ability to provide for yourself and others. Yeah. And not feeling like you can do that does make you feel like less of a man and a man unequal to maybe even have like companionship. And that is something that I did to myself. I allowed my fear of fucking to block, to cock block myself in the past. And then I allowed my feelings of being broke to do the same thing. And I just think we all got to figure out how to be a little nicer to each other, whatever that is in the meanwhile. Yeah. I actually wrote down that the quote that you were just referring to, you were talking about the guy that you realized he as a beautiful, thoughtful writer. And because he was so beautiful and thoughtful, he did not pursue a writing career. (laughs) And you you felt self-conscious because you weren't making a lot of money. And he felt self-conscious because he assumed you looked down on him for not being brave. Do you resent your passion for writing and your commitment to a, a field that is not predictably lucrative? You know, when he, that was sweet, he said that shit, but like, I, 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 did not, I did not romanticize writing and no one has ever fucking heard me romanticize writing in that way. Like that whole like thing about, I mean, and this is not to dismiss people. I, I get the concept of block. When people ask me about writer's block, I'm like, um, are you being paid for it? When is it due? Is that how you pay your rent and your bills? Right. You'll get over that block because you got something to do. So for me, and I think one thing about, it's not on the same level, but I do think it's comparable. 
like and when we talk about way stagnation and all this in the country, when I think about how much writing I have done on the internet of all places, that amount of volume, in addition to like, and I, again, I say like writing two books, I've written a lot of stuff and as passionate and hardworking as I, hardworking as I am, I don't want to do all that fucking writing, but you know why I've done all that fucking writing? Because I got bills and I got it done. But I add the caveat, if I could not support myself as a writer, I mean, yes, I struggle, but I could actually be struggling with a lot of different professions. As I mentioned in the book, like, I have been a teacher, I could have been a lot of things. Certain people who look down on me, I'm like, I make more money than you. But the problem isn't that I'm not working hard, it's the fact that I'm not still not being paid enough. Got like this loan on my back. Like, no matter what I'm doing, like a thousand dollars a month in loans would eat most people a lot, mm-hmm. no matter what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. So, I've done every type of work in and outside of writing, I've done every type of writing. But if I could not support myself, I literally would have left this shit. In fact, I'm not saying just, I, I was funny when you reached out because I thought it's interesting. A few years ago, a tech company reached out to me potentially about working when I really just wrote a referral for a friend, uh, colleague that I work with that we became friends. They were trying to hire me. I was like, you know what? This book shit don't work out. If I don't get this deal, because at this time I'm like 31, 32, I'm like, I need to go make some real money because mm-hmm. I don't think media knows how to still make money. So at least they do in tech. Will that make me feel, you know, excited creatively and like like how those people do online? No, but I would have made more money and I would have found another way. You know what I mean? Like I just but, but there's something that's keeping you doing this. I mean, you've published two I, two books yes. that are selling quite well. Clearly you're attached to a dream, you know? You're attached I'm attached to a dream, but my dream is yielding tangible results. Mm-hmm. But if it were not, yeah. then I would not. Right. If I can't be Jesus, which you know. I don't have any problem saying it. I keep saying it. I, you know, I'm glad I out earned my advance. Most authors don't, but the reason why I out earned it because it was smaller. Right. And yeah. again, when you talk about debt, if I graduate and I didn't have any debt, that wouldn't have altered the fact that, you know, I can't control that publishers think because I'm black and gay that I have a smaller market because they think white people don't care about black people and they think black people are too homophobic, which is a lot of what I had to do when I was promoting I Can't Date Jesus. I had to, and that's a verbatim basically quote mm. that I've heard from people. So, I got paid less based on the presumption that I am less than. I can't control things like that. So, but I do realize how that's going to impact my bottom line. So I had to grit and go through a lot of stuff. Like with I Can't Date Jesus, I lost my insurance. I mentioned in the book. I don't mention this part, but I, you know, also could have lost my apartment. I was struggling. I got help, and I don't ask for help. I'm too prideful. Right. Which is that's what I had to work through. But again, like if that period didn't end well, like if I didn't even get like the, thankfully like the option thing, just like a signal to keep going, yeah, I would have done real reassessment because I think, you know, pursue your dreams, be very strategic about it, be very vigilant. That's also the thing with me. Like I have had a vision for my life for a really long time. People talk about how you wrote the two back, like the books back to back. That's back to back to you. I had been trying <laughs> to get a book for I Can't Date Jesus for like eight years. Right. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I already had an idea to write about student loan debt. That should be bothering me every day. Of course, I'm going to talk about it next. I hope that makes it. Like, I just, I, I, I do believe in myself. I accepted in, in this book that, you know, the faith a lot of times I was looking for, again, is in me. I got that in the first book in a different way, particularly about the struggle part. But, yeah, dream big, but also you have to have results, especially as you get older. I'm, I'm 36 years old. If this wasn't going to work out, then I, I have to be open to something else. And, frankly... I still am pushing obvious dreams, but I'm also, you know, if the economy goes a certain way and if I have to revisit another way, I'm still humble enough to accept that. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I believe in myself, but we have to kind of just be on, when I look at my bank account, if I'm not good, then I got to look, <laughs> figure some shit out. I'll stop now. Promise. No, no, it's fine. But the reason I came back to dreams is another quote I wrote down is like, you felt like you were raised by two people who had had their dreams stripped from them. What was your home life yeah. like growing up? Well, uh, it's it, uh, the more that's more about Kendra Jesus, but it was. I'll just say I love my parents very dearly, but it was very much a chaotic situation. Um, my dad's, you know, his alcoholism was some violence in the home, but I do love my parents, and I've made peace with a lot of that as much as I can. But in terms of the dream part, my mom's a nurse. She went back to school. I really do admire her, but she told me she wanted to be a doctor. Um, she was just. But, you know, even with the, she became an LBN and then years later she went back to school and she became an RN so she could make more money. Mm-hmm. So she gave us a little bit more of a help. And that is to me still, and she took shit from my dad. She took shit from other people, but she did it anyway because she saw, she wasn't short-sighted. She saw the bigger picture. She saw that if she just gritted her teeth and deal with the pain and just go through with it, it'll be hard, but she'll get through. And she did. 
And that is an instance of me like somebody, you don't have to bury all of your dreams. Some just have to be set aside for a while, but you can go back to it. And so I always looked at that just early on, like I want to continue to do things. But the part about the dream thing, I'll just say, my parents are two people who I love very much and they love all their children. But they're also two people who didn't want to be married. They wanted to kind of pursue more ambitious things and life happened. The, the, the circumstances of the times, among other things, kind of kept them in a situation. Money keeps a lot of people in situations that where they don't get to necessarily pursue their, I don't, I don't even just say bigger purpose because I mean, that can sound whimsical, but even just some shit that they really love to do that'll pay them what they deserve. It's just so hard for a lot of people to get it. And I continue to write the credit with the thing. My mom didn't you know, want me to take these lines. She, she saw what this was, but she still lent her name to it. You know, she allowed me to dream. And so that's what I mean by like the dream has to always still produce tangible results. Because while it's important to dream and pursue your passion, when I think about the sacrifices my mom continues to do, as I write in a very hard chapter for me, the hardest thing I've probably ever written, the idea that I felt like another black man potentially letting her down ate me alive and no amount of dreaming would keep me going if I didn't feel like all of this was actually giving me some like positive results that I could look towards to keep going. That was really important for me. When I ask about your folks, it's something you cover more in the first book than in the new one, but your background certainly informs how you showed up at college to make the decisions and how you financed your education. Did growing up in those circumstances and also growing up gay make you more ambitious professionally? In other words, do you feel compelled to prove yourself on a level that straight white kids probably don't worry about? There are certain people who look for validation. I don't necessarily, and I know you're not saying I'm looking for that. Oh, I'm looking, I'm, sure, I'm, 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 I'm looking oh. for validation. I just, oh. I mean, like, I, I think everybody is. I just wonder sort of like, is there, I mean, I think all well, of us. It's a, I, I, when I, I mean about validation, I think sometimes people necessarily, like for me, the people that are like, oh, you can't sell a book because of blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I'm really proud I made the list. And I'm really proud that I, I showed throughout, like, you know, the media thing, the press run for the first book, which is a lot of me. That, yeah, I had bigger appeal than they thought because a good story is a good story. Like, I have faith in a reader. I don't believe that someone's going to say, oh, black, gay, using these references. I, I don't know what they mean. I'm not going to read it. I read shit all the time for white people. I don't know what the fuck it is. I Google the shit. <laughs> it's not that big of a deal. Right. So have faith. I do take comfort in proving myself in that way, but that's not so much like to be validated for me personally. It's just to make sure I get the money I deserve. And also those that come after me have it easier because I think what was really important I can't date Jesus to even make the list. And hopefully I don't want to that poor does too, because again, there's this preconceived notion about people and their markability and their commercial viability. So after I can't date Jesus, you know, the same people that told me either my book had been done for, which was stupid, or that this book, you know, might be nice to read, but it won't sell. Now there are plenty of people, not just black, they're women of all types, queer people of all sorts, those who can like cite my book in their book proposal. Or I found out from people some even older than me that like my name comes up in their meetings now. And that helps them get book deals because again, for a really long time, you know, people told me a lot of really polite no's, but a lot of that shit was fucked up because they were essentially just saying, oh, cute little black you. Maybe if you package yourself in the way they were used to, I would throw you some money. You know, like those were some humiliating, frustrating, not necessarily humiliating, more humiliating for them to be so small minded, but frustrating meetings. So I do take some comfort in like, fuck y'all, I, I'm showing myself. But that's not really about me. That's just making sure whoever else has to go in those rooms will have to hear less of that stupidity. How much money would you need to have to feel economically stable? And then secondly, how much money would you need to have to feel rich? <laughs> um, see, this I'm so not rich. I don't even know what numbers to throw out. I'll say this. The fact that you can make maybe like low six or even like a little bit over $100,000 and still be broke, that ain't it. But that's still mostly a tie to my debt. I think once I really take off the Discover student loan that was formerly Citibank, once I get rid of that remaining balance, again, I'm going to do everything I can this year to get rid of that. Then I'll feel less stressed. I still got some other bills I need to pay for that kind of hang over my head. But again, I'm not letting them worry me so much. Let's hope the I Can't Date Jesus um, goes to series. Let's hope it gets to, it goes to the series order because while that might not necessarily make me rich overnight because, I mean, television, you can't put all your faith in any one thing, I would be making a lot more money for that type of writing than I would 
from the writing I do now. So I think life will be a little bit better. I think once I can start buying some property, because I don't even need to be rich. That would be nice. But I just want to feel like I don't owe anybody anything. Can I help my sister so she doesn't have to work so hard? Does my mom won't ask for anything, but if she did, can I like like maybe buy her a house or something? Like that would make me feel amazing. But I don't have to be, I don't know if a dollar amount. A millionaire would be lovely, but you know, <laughs> just being able to feel like I can actually thrive and not just survive is kind of good enough. But if people want to just keep throwing me money, I, I strongly encourage that. I've often said on this program and in real life that the richest I ever felt was the day I paid off my student loans. I've made a lot of money since then, but there's this feeling of like, oh shit, I'm finally back to even. That is as rewarding and sort of palpable as, as any financial experience I've had. That's really well said. I think once I get to, I, I just want to get to even, and then I can think about what the next look looks like. Yeah. Because I mean, I think our culture and you know, you talk about our culture demonizes people for not having money. I totally agree with that. But a lot of people that don't have money, they dream about being rich and the opposite of broke isn't rich. The opposite of broke is not broke. Get to yes. even, <laughs> get to even, you know, like that's what I like. Like I wish that's what we could romanticize in our pop culture is like, you know, look at that dude over there. You know, he's on top of his financial game. So how do you feel when you read articles about frugality as the secret to getting out of debt? Just because you found a way to like make cat food seem edible or like you could live off of like wild caught Trader Joe's canned tuna for like seven years to pay off your $666,000 in debt. That's not an inspirational story. None of us should have to be doing anything like that to pay off debt. These people should not, first of all, higher education should not cost as much. Then these companies should be more accommodating and work with us. But those things are not like a firm, even with like how you talk about some people's attitude, think, yeah, I just, I want to be rich. They don't aspire for not just broke because they have to be rich because if you're rich, then you're better than somebody. So you feel mm, superior. Right. So that's what you need to do. You need to find your value in that way. That's just the wrong way to look. And even with just the frugality thing, I think it's the same concept. It's kind of like, you are supposed to be so much more, I don't know, you're more responsible, you're more of a dog, like you want it more because you you did the the most extreme thing to get out of an awful situation, out of your design fastest, fastest. That doesn't make you a hero. Congratulations on paying off your debt. Good for you doing whatever sacrifices you have to do. You ain't got shit to do with me. It has nothing to do with anybody else's debt. And these stories are fluff. This is not the problem. We need to talk about debt cancellation, not this. What do you want that author to know about you and your background or or about what's broken in society that would have them see the bigger picture? You know, I think right now we are literally living in a moment, which is kind of a dumb parable, but I think the lesson right now is that people, if they were just more compassionate, if they could be more considerate of someone besides themselves, look how less awful this is, this would all be right now. Imagine if people could just like let go of whatever they need temporarily and stay in the house. Imagine if Donald Trump could think about something beyond his ratings and his approval stuff. Even thing with him, I don't want him to be reelected, but imagine if he had just shut down the country for a month, gave people money, talked to us like adults, talked to him like he was an actual adult, and just said, this is going to be difficult, but we will get through this together. Imagine if that had been the tone set. How much easier, how less painful, how many less people would have to die and suffer? People are dying and suffering alone. All out of ego and selfishness. And even now, I saw some people in grocery lines. I'm like, if you don't learn to respect personal space, I have literally sprayed people with Lysol on the plane because they don't know how to act. But again, that's about, we need to just be more considerate of each other. So if there's anything to take away from me, my books, particularly I don't want to die poor, is to learn to think less of yourself and to have compassion for the person next to you. Because that could very much be you at any given moment. Well said. You say in the closing of the book, you say you don't want to be the black elder from a Tyler Perry film, Atlanta guy, by the way, but you offer guidance to the reader, learn to forgive yourself. Have you forgiven yourself for the financial mistakes you've made in your life? Yes, I did the best that I could with the best information I had available. And so many people asked me, would you have done anything different? Maybe I wouldn't have, you know, I would have ideally not taken private loans. Maybe I would have went the government way if somebody had told me and just figured it out. But if I had to go back and do the exact same thing again, would I? Probably. I mean, yes, because I wouldn't be here. And the problem isn't the choice I made. 
It's the fact that I was put in a position to make that choice and the fact that our society continues to make people make these types of choices for no other reason than simply wanting to have the advantages that so many other people are just born with. So I don't regret anything. I forgive myself for doing the best that I could. And there's no sense in like regretting because I don't need to age anymore. Donald Trump is aging me fast too much already. (laughs) (laughs) Michael, I really appreciate you spending time with me today. Where can our listeners find out more about you and your writing? Michael Arsenault, A-R-C-E-N-E-A-U-X. I can't date Jesus and I don't want to die poor of the books. You can find me online running in my mouth um, at Young, Y-O-U-N-G-S-I-N-I-C-K. That's Young Cynic. It was my failed rap name. Long story, but when you start social media in 2009, you just got to stick with the shit. Sorry, and rock, roll with it. <laughs> and before we jump off, what was the name of your first mixtape going to be? Cognac and Selexa. Um, Cognac um, <laughs> nods the brown look of all the black elders or and white elders in the South. People love they brown. Um, and Selexa, my favorite antidepressant of the past. Yes. Well, let's hope your book goes to series and you can uh, celebrate with a little Cognac and Selexa. Uh, Yeah, we're working on both of them. I appreciate you making space. Thank you so much. All right, Michael. Thanks a bunch. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for making time to be on Crazy Money. I appreciate your perspective. I found your book to be very entertaining, and I look forward to reading more of your stuff in the future. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, if you like what we're doing here at Crazy Money, I sure would appreciate it if you would take a minute to rate and review this show. How do you do it? Here's how you do it on iTunes. Go to the show page on your phone, just the main page where it shows you all the different episodes and you scroll all the way to the bottom. You go all the way to the bottom where it says ratings and reviews and there you click on a whole bunch of stars and then you write something nice about me and my hairline. That'd be lovely. Or just say what you truly believe about the show. Remember, it's a great day and you got to keep that joy, joy, joy down in your heart. Mike Carano, make me sound smart.